Thank you, Josh. Thanks, James. Okay, so looking back, uh, it seems to me that there has been a question running throughout the course. This question is, are things what we assume them to be? In week three, James asked whether the source of state authority lies in consensus, as we might think, or whether it in fact lies in a monopoly on the use of force. In week four, Rob complicated the claim that we have inalienable rights, rights that cannot be taken away from us, showing that it is the state that gives us our rights, and more to the point, the state that takes them away. In week five, Janice showed that contra the liberal narrative of history as progress, inequality in the form of racism and sexism persist in Australian society. In week six, James took what is legal and what is just apart, showing that what is in accordance with the law is not necessarily what is just. In week seven, Rob showed that the media, being a business, sacrifices truth in the pursuit of profit, such that what might have been news, although perhaps we're being a bit naive, what might have been news is now gossip and entertainment. In week eight, James questioned whether our bodies are really our own, in week 10, uh, Judith Besant, in her paper, asked whether liberalism meaningfully allows dissent as it purports to. And in week 11, Rob, among other things, asked whether neoliberalism, and suggested that it didn't, hasn't uh, achieved what its proponents said it would, uh, that instead of making the world a better place, it has intensified inequality. So why have we asked this question? Well, um, you have to see how things really are in order to think about how you might make them better in order to go about actually making them better, right? But this requires something. This requires the ability to think. Indeed, on Hannah Arendt's view, thinking may well be the difference between moral abomination and right action, between the Holocaust and the avoidance of it. Uh, in her book, I Commit in Jerusalem, The Banality of Evil, um, Arendt remakes sense of Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann's actions. Uh, Eichmann uh, was a Nazi war criminal. At the end of World War II, he fled, in, he fled uh, Austria for Argentina, where in 1960, I think, he was captured um, by the Israeli security service, taken to Jerusalem for a trial, he was charged on 15 counts. He was ultimately found guilty, um, sentenced to death, and hanged. So these are, these are the major things with which he was charged and found guilty. He was ultimately responsible for the murder of millions of Jews. He placed these Jews before they were murdered in living conditions designed to kill them. He caused them grave physical and mental harm. He took actions which resulted in the sterilization of Jews and otherwise prevented childbirth. He caused the enslavement, starvation, and deportation of millions of Jews. He caused general persecution of Jews based on national, racial, religious, and political grounds. He spoiled Jewish property by inhuman measures involving compulsion, robbery, terrorism, and violence. <clears throat> All of the above were punished by war crimes. He deported a half million Poles. He deported 14,000 Slovenes. He deported tens of thousands of gypsies. He deported and murdered 100 Czech children from the village of Ladis. Now, throughout his trial, Eichmann, Eichmann maintained that he was innocent, that all he was guilty of was, was following orders, that he had no choice but to do so. Uh, Arendt, Arendt, in her book, she says that Eichmann was not enthralled to ideology, that he was not full of hate, uh, that he was not a psychopath, that he was not a sociopath, that he was not any sort of path at all, he was not a monster, he was not evil. She says that it was none of these things that led him to do what he did. What led him to do what he did, she says, is something as banal sounding as a failure to think. Of attending his trial, she says, I was struck by the manifest shallowness in the doer that made it impossible to trace the incontestable evil of his deeds to any deeper level or roots or motives. The deeds were monstrous, but the doer was quite ordinary, commonplace, and neither demonic nor monstrous. 
There was no sign in him of firm ideological convictions or of specific evil motives. And the only notable characteristic one could detect in his past behaviour, as well as in his behaviour during the trial, was something entirely negative. It was not stupidity, but thoughtlessness. What Arendt provides here is an insight into Eichmann, but it is also an insight into what enables cruelty and conversely what enables or what might enable morally right action. It is an insight into the place of thought in human action and it is also, and I just realised this recently really, it is also an insight into us. Because, I say that because if Eichmann failed to think, in calling him a monster, so did we. We dissociated him from humanity, from our natures, and thereby refused to think about our own capability for cruelty. I think in that way we also failed to think. But what I've said so far, that frames the problem as a kind of negative one, right? We failed to think. But Actually, we also told a story about humanity. We told a story about humanity as being good, as not capable of that sort of evil. You have to become a monster in order to do such cruel things. This, I think, is what Rob was getting at when he asked, what did we learn from the Holocaust? We learned that the Nazis were bastards and that we were good. What are the consequences of telling this kind of story? I'm not entirely sure, but I do think that to the extent that we take apart humanity and cruelty, we make it very difficult, perhaps even met metaphysically impossible, for us to see our own actions as bad actions. If we're human beings, and human beings can't do that kind of cruelty, then whatever we do, it must be good. I wonder if this is the kind of thinking that allows the white Australians who took Indigenous Australian children from their families to see what they were doing as something morally good, which they did. In addition to this, I think that even those of us who say we believe Arendt, who think that this, even those of us who think that this was a brilliant and true insight, I think that we do not deep in our hearts really believe her we do not think that we really could become the sort of person that Eichmann became. We do not think that we really are capable of that. Which is minimally ironic. I think in doing that, we are committing exactly the kind of failure to think of which Arendt is speaking. And I, I think that this failure to, to think should make us stop and think about thinking itself. And this is kind of what I'm up to in the lecture. Okay, but simply insisting that we should all think is well and good, right? If it were that easy, I think we would just all do it. The fact that we don't says to me that it is very hard. And I want to take seriously the difficulty of thinking. But Equally, I want to take seriously the possibility of doing that. This is for two reasons. The first reason is that it seems clear to me that throughout history people have managed to do it. This is a kind of the proof is in the pudding argument, right? Um, you know, um, during, during the abolition of transatlantic slave trade, people managed to think that the enslavement of people of Africans and Indians that that was not okay, that slavery was not morally permissible. They managed to think that against the grain. Uh, during the civil rights era, African Americans ma managed to think that they were not contra what they were told all the time by the people who were considered authoritative, that they were not inferior. That I think is really amazing. Um, and so did not deserve to be treated as such. Um, feminists have recognized that women are equal persons to men and so should not be treated as inferior. But, um, but there's, another, there's another reason that I, want to, that I want to talk about the possibility of thinking. And this is that, like Arendt, I think thinking is really important. So I just, quite simply, cannot conscionably put forward an account of thinking that makes it impossible. I just cannot, cannot bear to do that. Um, 
Okay, so, so I'm first, this is how I'm going to proceed. I'm going to first talk about the, well, I'm going to first define thinking. I'm going to then talk about the difficulty of thinking. And I'm going to then try and work us out of that. Um, now, there are a number of ways you could go at the difficulty of thinking, right? But given the context of this course, a course on power, how I'm going to do that is by thinking about the extent to which our ability to think is constrained. I'm going to think about the things, what I take to be some of the primary things constraining our thinking are. Okay, so what is it to think? American philosopher John Dewey very helpfully um, gives four kind of four meanings of the word um, think. He says that to think is, in the most trivial sense, just to have or to form in the mind. It is to imagine or to speculate. It is to believe. Or, and this is, this is the one that we're homing in on, it is to consider the basis and consequences of beliefs. Uh, expanding on this fourth meaning, Dewey says, active, persistent, and careful consideration of any belief or supposed form of knowledge in light of the grounds that support it and the consequences that follow from it. To unpack this, Dewey is saying that to think is to assess, assess the grounds and the consequences of what is put before you. So the fourth is the meaning of thinking that we're taking. So now that we've kind of got our definition of thinking, I'm going to think about what constrains our ability to think. The first thing that I want to talk about is the epistemic authority of the speaker. Okay, so what, what I have in mind here is the, is the authority of someone putting something forward, but it's a specific kind of authority. It is the authority that comes with being seen as a right knower, as a person who knows best. Um, episteme means knowledge, epistemic authority as the authority that you have as a knower, right? Okay, so a person has epistemic authority insofar as they are seen as being a right knower. So the question then is, what makes you be seen as a right knower? I think that, uh, well, in Western society anyway, our idea of right knowing is objectivity. As Richard Rorty says, in our culture, the notions of science, rationality, objectivity, and truth are bound up with one another. Science is thought of as offering hard, objective truth, truth as correspondence to reality, the only sort of truth worthy of the name. So what makes a person be seen as a right knower, then, is whatever makes a person be seen as being objective. Oh, missed that slide. Objectivity, Catherine McKinnon puts it as the non-situated distance standpoint. Thomas Nagel puts it as the view from nowhere. Think, okay, so I guess this sounds abstract, but think about how in day-to-day -day life people say things like, we've got to get some distance from this, or just step back and try to look at it coolly and calmly, or set your emotions aside and think of, try and think about this in a bit of a detached way. What they're doing here is encouraging you to approach whatever it is that you're thinking about objectively, and they're encouraging you to do that because being objective is how you're going to get the best understanding of something, right? Um, or you might have encountered this more in arguments when people like, kind of really scornfully dismiss your view on the grounds that you're you know, too emotionally invested or what have you. Yes, I know how that feels. Um, Okay, so this, this also is why, I want to, well, this is up here for, um, this is why I think science is socially revered, because we think of objectivity as characterising scientific method. So science then becomes the paradigmatic way of knowing, right? Um, oh. Because of this, when people have tried to convince us of claims, 
they've often tried to show that their claims have a scientific underpinning so, uh, so as to convince us of those claims. And, you know, they've pretty well succeeded. Um, so here are some examples. Samuel George Morton, um, he was a physician, uh, natural scientist. He, um, he argued that whites have the biggest intellect and blacks the smallest, yeah, no surprise, right? Um, he was using skull capacity as an indicator there. So the bigger the skull, the bigger the intellectual capacity, and that's what he found. Francis Galton, um, among other things, an English statistician and psychologist, he argued that mental ability is largely inherited. And um, on his measurement, African people were at least two grades lower than European people, and Indigenous Australian people were at the very bottom. They had the lowest mental ability. He also um, is considered to have come up with the concept of eugenics. Um, eugenics is the idea of improve, improving humanity um, by encouraging, like, through selective breeding. Um, so encouraging the fittest people, the best people, uh, to procreate and sterilising the unfittest or the worst people so that they don't. Just in case this is giving you the impression that this is a thing of the past, and I really do not want to give this impression, um, the third is a current example. Simon Baron Cohen, who is a neuroscientist at Cambridge, no less, uh, argues in his book, The Essential Difference, it was published in 2003, Men, Women and the Extreme Male Brain, that the female brain is empathising and the male brain is systematising. And if you read his definition of systematising, what he means by that is that men are good at if-then statements. Men are good at logic. So women are really good at feeling and men are really good at thinking rationally. And if you know that thinking rationally has been seen since Aristotle as constituting humanity, you know where that leaves women. They're not full people, anyhow. Um, hang on, I'm getting... Okay, that doesn't matter. Um, okay, when I was talking about this last week in our tutors meeting, I'm just going to throw you under the bus here, Dan. <laughs> um, Dan said, okay, but... All of that stuff, that pseudoscience, right? It's not science. And I suspect that at this point, that might be what a lot of you are thinking. Like, all of that stuff, that was pseudoscience, it wasn't science. Um, and before why I say that I think that misses the point, um, I also have a theory about why you're thinking that. Um, I think that you're thinking that, that this stuff, like Francis Galton and whatever, um, you're thinking that that is pseudoscience not just because you want to accurately describe the research, um, it's because you want to hold on to a certain image of yourself. That's what I think is going on. Um, okay, so, so what you want to do is believe that you're different from and better than all of the people who came before you, all of the people who subscribe to those, to those claims, um, the claims about whites being the most intellectual, whatever. Um, you want to think of yourself as a person who wouldn't have fallen for that, um, and so a person who wouldn't have acted in accordance with that. So how do you do that? Well, because you see yourself as a person who, as a person who believes in science, a person who thinks scientifically, who does not fall for pseudoscience, who does not believe nonsense about lemon juice curing cancer, by calling all of this stuff pseudoscience, you can see yourself as a person who would not have fallen for this sort of stuff, right? That's part of what I think is going on in this. The second part of what is going on in this is that um, you, want to, you want to think that your beliefs now are sound. And because you derive your beliefs from science, or what is accepted in scientific communities, you distinguish science from pseudoscience. Right? So science, if it's done properly, that gets you to knowledge, to truth. So that's why you make that distinction. Um, but firstly, these claims, they were widely accepted in scientific communities. They had the status of scientific claims. Uh, Morton was a highly respected physician, a natural scientist, Eugenics was widely accepted too in the US. Uh, MIT geneticist Frederick Adams favor favorably reviewed eugenicist Madison Grant's book, The Passing of the Great Race, in the journal Science, no less. Uh, every genetics textbook ad advocated eugenics um, and put forward the case for it, showing how, genetic eugenics, showing how genetics could be used to solve 
social problems. Um, so, like, if these claims were accepted in scientific communities, there is a real sense in which they had the status of science. So I think, to me, there's something not quite right about just dismissing them as pseudoscience. It doesn't make sense to compare, if these claims have the status of science, right, it doesn't make sense really to compare them to claims that you now know as having the status of pseudoscience. Claims like, you know, lemon juice kills cancer, or, um, yeah, or, or stuff about climate change not happening, or about uh, vaccination causing autism, right? These are not equivalents. Um, if you do, what the equivalent would be is to, to all of this stuff is something now that is accepted in scientific communities that in the future people will find out to have been wrong. That is your equivalent. So this is why it seems to me that there is something slightly wrong about just dismissing all of this stuff as pseudoscience. Um, Okay, so what this means is that firstly, you can't be sure that you would have known better than these people. And secondly, you can't be sure that you aren't those people now. Um, I guess, so what I'm trying to get at here is that I think in doing this, that was pseudoscience, not science thing, we're actually committing another failure to think. Um, all right, okay, so back to the question. How does... So I was saying that epistemic authority constrains our ability to think. So how does it do this? Well, if we see a person as being a right knower, then we think that it is rational to accept her claims and irrational to challenge them. A person who is a right knower is a person who knows best. It makes perfect sense to accept what they say, right? Um, this is why, throughout history, we have seen people who have challenged the right knowers of the time, we've seen them as, like, quote-unquote crazy, you know? Uh, Galileo, Mary Wollstonecraft, um, Virginia Woolf, now I think a little bit Richard Rorty. Uh, we think of these people as being crazy because they challenged the right knowers of their time. So then think about the connotations of rational and irrational. To be rational is to be agreeable to reason, to be sensible, to be thinking soundly, to be sane. To be irrational is to be thinking unsoundly, to be insane, if you like. Um, Okay, so what this makes clear is that to be rational is desirable, to be irrational is not, which is something I know you all intuitively know. If that's right, and if it's rational to accept what a right knower says as true, and if we want to be rational, then we want to believe what they say, right? So it becomes really hard to resist what they say. Um, So I think that this is one way that, um, that our ability to think is constrained. Um, we, th we think that it's rational to accept what right now say is true. We want to be rational, so we accept it, right? We don't think about it. But I think that there's also another way in which the authority of a speaker um, can constrain our ability to know. This is a much a much deeper, more problematic way. I think that by accepting what a right knower says is true, in some cases, we can actually make it become true. Philosopher Ian Hacking calls this looping. You might see why. I'm going to give an example. Um, I'm going to take this example from the work of feminist philosopher Catherine McKinnon. This is, this is her argument. She says that, um, that masculine qualities are seen as enabling objectivity. You know, men are capable of detachment, of externality from the object of inquiry, hence of objectivity. But women are seen as being ruled by emotions, so incapable of objectivity. If objectivity is the right way of knowing, as I've said it is, uh, socially, then men are seen as being right knowers, while women are not. What this means is that what men have said has been accepted as true, while what women have said has not. She, McKinnon goes on, she says, so this means that men's image of a woman then gets accepted as what a woman is. And as it is accepted, 
it is established, is accepted to be, to be clear by both men and women. Of course, also by women because they they're, they're rational and want to believe what a right now says is true. Um, so she says that it is accepted um, as what a woman is, as it is accepted, it is established in women's minds as what they ought to become, right? So women then, um, knowing what that image is, um, in order to socially exist as the beings they are said to be, women actually become that image. That's what, that's what McKinnon argues. Um, okay, so then she says, um, what this means is that what, what women are is just what men say women are. She, okay, so what do men say women are? She says, well, Simone, what's, let's take from Simone de Beauvoir here. Um, and Simone de Beauvoir says that what men say women are is the feminine being. So McKinnon says, so that means women really are feminine beings. So here, also, you lose your ability to talk about things like gender stereotypes. McKinnon, in, in a way, is saying, actually, we have the power in some cases to make things like stereotypes actually become true. Um, so then consider, this is, I guess this is kind of scary stuff. Um, so then consider the qualities of a feminine being. Submissive, fragile, vulnerable, timid, selfless, emotional, helpless, things like that, right? Um, so the qualities of a feminine being deprive women of autonomy, independence, strength, both of mind and of body, security of self, courage, ambition, intellect, uh, maturity, all qualities requisite to fulfilling one's potential to succeeding as a person. So what, what McKinnon is arguing is that, to put it really bluntly, she is saying that women actually come to have the deficiencies and incapacities that they are said to have, but just not for the reason for which they are said to have them. They do not biologically have all these deficiencies or incapacities as they are said to, but there is a real sense in which they have them and we would be delusional not to see that. Um, I guess this is not a nice idea, right? Um, and not to mislead you, a lot of people don't, don't like McKinnon's idea. Uh, personally, I think there's something that really makes a lot of sense about this. I think that what McKinnon is doing is is just not, she's refusing to deny the power that you have if you're considered a right knower. She's also refusing to deny the damage of inequality, I think. She's kind of asking, how on earth is it possible that women could be equal to men, which is something that gets said a lot, right? Like, no, women really are equal, so they deserve equal opportunity and all this, all this stuff. She's saying, how could they really be equal when they have never been seen as equal and so they have never been treated as equal? Like, just how could this be possible? And, I, do th I think that that makes sense. Um, okay. But if this is what happens, if we can actually, if people who have the power of being a right knower can actually make their claims true, what the hell are we to do? Like, how, how can we think in those kinds of cases? Um, as I said earlier, I do want to take seriously um, the possibility of being able to think. Um, so, so what are we to do? I think that the first thing that we need to do is have a sense of history. I th what I'm thinking here is that having a sense of history means being aware, firstly, that everyone who has come before us has seen themselves just as we see ourselves. They thought they were right and everyone who came before them was wrong. They thought that they were progressive when everyone who came before them was backward. <laughs> they thought that they were doing the good thing when everyone who came before them was doing the wrong, just as we think that, right? Um, you know, the people responsible for the stolen generation thought they were good people doing the right thing. The people giving lobotomies thought they were good people doing the right thing. The people responsible for taking babies with Down syndrome from their mothers and putting them in institutions thought they were good people doing the right thing. If all of these people have turned out to be wrong, then what reason do we have for thinking that we're any different? To me, this seems like, firstly, 
totally arrogant, and secondly, totally unreflective. And insofar as we do this, believe that we really are right, I think we're just proving how much we are like all those people who came before us, people who think that they really are right, even, even though everyone else before them thought the same thing and were wrong. So having a sense of history, I think, helps us to perceive our own ability to get things wrong, and in that way helps us to doubt ourselves. And doubting ourselves is what releases us from presumption and compels us to think. So this is one reason, I think, for which having a sense of history really does help. Um, having a sense of history often leads me to wonder what our version of this will be, like what, what will future people look back on and ask, I guess in the same way that we do at the Holocaust, right, um, and ask, how, like, how, how did they do that? Or how did they let that happen? But um, I suppose the thing about this is that it's kind of impossible to think about this because the whole point is that whatever our version of this is, it is something about which we are totally oblivious just as people in the past were totally oblivious, which does my head need to think about and is a scary thought, right? So whatever, whatever you're thinking might be that thing, like our treatment of asylum seekers, even that will not totally be the version of it because that at least we do have some, well, you know, maybe some small sense of um, being wrong. Uh, okay, so the second reason for which having a sense of history can help is that it means being aware um, that that, or it helps us to be aware that people who have been considered right knowers that you've been wrong before, right? Um, you know, that the epistemic authorities of the time, that, that they were epistemic authorities, it did not save them from, from being wrong. And I think this awareness prevents us from kind of just blindly trusting or believing the epistemic authorities of our time. Those, if we look to history, we know that those people are fallible. So, so why would it make sense to just totally believe them? Um, and I think that if we can do this, then that also overcomes the kind of the rationality problem. If we can recognise that right knowers, they're fallible, then I think we can also see that we can challenge what they say, that it's rational to challenge what they say. Um, okay, but this, I think, this doesn't quite go far enough. This tells us, or it encourages us to proceed with caution, but it doesn't, it doesn't give, give us any, it doesn't guide us. It doesn't give us any instruction in how we should approach thinking. Um, okay, so typically when, when we think, we apply the criterion of truth in the sense of correspondence to reality. Okay, so what I mean by this is that we are, if, like, when we're thinking about a claim that's put before us, so let's take the claim that um, women, women are inferior, we think, okay, hang on, let's, let me look at how women actually are in the world. Are they inferior? No, they're not. Okay, now I can say that your claim is wrong. It's, it's untrue because it does not correspond to reality. Your claim is that women are inferior. In reality, they're not. Uh, your claim does not correspond to it. Therefore, it's not true, right? Um, Richard Rorty, who's a favourite philosopher of mine, he thinks that this is not so helpful. He thinks we should apply a different criterion. He thinks we should not ask, does this correspond to reality? Is this how things are? He thinks we should ask instead, is it good for us to believe this? Um, this, this idea, you might realise, does constitute a radical shift in thinking, and um, I don't want to mislead you. It's not widely accepted. A lot of people are very critical of it. Um, but I, I guess I feel increasingly drawn to it, and actually increasingly drawn to it, having, um, having been in this course and heard all of these lectures. Um, I think that there might be a lot to be gained by applying this criterion, by asking not does it correspond to reality, but is it good for us to believe this? I think that it might release us from constrained and circular and missing the point debates. Um, let me give an example of this so you can see what I'm getting at. 
Um, Belinda Johnson, who is a lecturer here, um, she's taking a subject, I know some of you are doing self and society. She gave a lecture the other week um, on, on disability. Um, she framed the lecture with this question, how can we and why should we think about disability in ways other than the ways we are generally encouraged to? How can we and why should we think about disability in ways other than what we are generally directed to? She began by showing a picture of a tiny baby and, and she asked us what we saw. What we saw was a being of limitless potential. And then she added on top, and then she added on top of the baby's face um, this medical terminology on particular parts of the baby's face. And th this terminology designates the characteristics of Down syndrome, Belinda explained. And she went on to say how in the moment of this medical diagnosis, this baby becomes disabled and it ceases to be a being of limitless potential. Now, she didn't, she didn't from that point go on to actually engage with the medical discourse at all. Um, she, didn't, she didn't try to challenge it. She didn't try to say that it doesn't correspond to reality, that it's, that it's wrong, that, um, or anything like that, that it's, that it's inaccurate. Instead, to me, what she was trying to do was encourage us to think differently about disability, not because the dominant way of thinking about it, the medical discourse way of thinking about it is wrong, but because it's just not good for us to believe that. That's to me what she was trying to do by doing this. Um, she was suggesting that, that whatever the medical discourse says, what is good for us to believe is that this baby is a being of limitless potential not that it is a being of constrained potential. And that, for her, seemed to be enough. Um, you could take as another example the one I gave earlier, where I said that women come to have the deficiencies and the incapacities uh, that men say they do. Think about how, in, the, in these sorts of cases, we can't apply the criterion of truth as correspondence to reality. So, people say, oh, women are inferior. You can't actually, if women have come to have that inferiority, you can't actually then point out to the world and be like, ah, no, but see, they don't have any of those qualities. The problem is that they do have those qualities because they've been made to have those qualities. So I think the criterion of what, what it is good for us to believe might also be helpful here. Um, I guess you could, in this case, you could try and say, um, okay, but hang on, women only have those qualities because they've been made to have them, not, not because of their biology. But I, but I suppose one thing I would say is that 